A warm welcome to the Good Investing Talks podcast. I'm your host, Tilman Fersch, and I'm very happy that you're discovering underfollowed investors and underfollowed companies together with me. Before we jump into this conversation, I want to thank my supporters. They help me to keep this channel free and public for everyone. Thank you very much. If you also want to join the Good Investing Supporters Club, please click on the link below. You're very welcome. And now, one last step. Here's the disclaimer for you. All we are doing here is no advice and no recommendation. Please always do your own work. And now, enjoy the video. Dear audience of Good Investing Talks, it's great to have you back on the show. And today, we are portraying another emerging manager. We just started this format in the last podcast with Marco Kassmann of AlphaStar. And today, I'm having Joshua Collinsworth on. It's great to have you here, Joshua. Uh, where are you based in the world? Well, uh, thanks for having me on here, uh, Tillman. We've known each other now for, I don't know, like three years or so. And and uh, just really respect what you're building at Good Investing. And uh, I've gotten lots of introductions with people from it and uh, and some ideas. And it, it's a great platform. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm based in Denver, Colorado. It's a pleasure to have you. And it was a pleasure to already have met you in Omaha and now to the podcast. Um, you're an interesting guy. <laughs> Today it's two bearded men and two microphones, so it's <laughs> it's time for an investing podcast. And at the beginning of this podcast, I also want to talk a bit about your background. And you're an interesting guy. Um, you have these different backgrounds that are not typical in investing. So it's one is farming, uh, one is solar power constructing company, yeah, and one is the allocator. So maybe let's go all three of these. And all combined with the question, what you learned from the different tasks there for that are relevant for you as an investor. So maybe let's start with farming. What have you learned from it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in a family farming business. Uh, my father bootstrapped from having a job and saving money. He bootstrapped buying one location uh, and uh, to multiple locations by the time I was in college. Uh, and I was a part of that business growing and part of the team of people working on the farm all the time. And uh, it taught me a lot about small business and what's not what, what businesses like several, like uh, lots of industries uh, are not good industries. <laughs> uh, uh, farming is really tough. Uh, and uh, um, it taught me some things about just like cash flow management, you know, how a business uh, like a depreciation is like a real expense. <laughs> uh, you have to, uh, in like the whole concept of amortization, uh, when you have hard assets, you want to extend the life of that asset well beyond what the depreciation uh, schedule says it is. Uh, and if you can do that, you know, well over a long period of time, you can actually generate some cash flow out of a very low returning business. Um, that was like instilled in me at a really young age, uh, and, um, and did not, I, I kind of always knew I wanted to be a business person. Um, and I, and back in high school, I even had an interest in stocks. I've been buying stocks since like 15 years old, uh, but didn't know that it would be a, like it would go into being a stock picker, uh, like as a profession. But, uh, so I, I left the farming world and went to college in a town that was like an hour and a half away. And I got into the solar development business uh, at the time because um, a lot of funding had come from the government to uh, finance solar. And uh, I joined a, a group that had done it before back in the 70s, back when Jimmy Carter uh, was president and had, you know, initially done some funding there. Uh, and then that kind of went away when Reagan got elected. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and oil got cheap again. Um, but it's, it came back and it's back for good now. But, uh, I joined this team that had, uh, done this for a really long time and they were really good engineers and we, we were building solar throughout the Southeast, which was kind of, uh, contrarian, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the economics of solar arrays in the Southeast back when I was building them, um, was not very good. Uh, but we were still getting projects done. And, um, and, and big projects. I mean, we did some small stuff in, in commercial scale, but we went all the way into megawatt scale projects that I was a project manager on, which kind of touched all the, the, uh, um, 
uh, functions of engineering and product procurement, uh, a little bit of inside sales even, uh, and then construction management and then commissioning the projects, like all that touching a lot of things, a lot of busy work, uh, but also a lot of like risk management um, of you have a budget and you're trying to, you know, bring a project, to, you know, uh, to completion within time and, and budget. Um, but yeah, I did that for several years and, uh, uh, then got the opportunity to join a, what I call a concentrated family office. Let me, let me f quickly follow up. What did you learn for investing from the solar power construction company? Uh, you know, I, I think today that I've learned, um, uh, that, uh, You know, I've thought about this and uh, and I would say that I, I had a really good boss and he gave me a long lead and was and I had control of budget, you know, at like 22 years old <laughs> uh, uh, and made some big mistakes. Uh, and, you know, and the boss uh, that I had uh, let me make those mistakes uh, would slap my wrist when I lost when I lost his money. <laughs> but I uh, but, you know, I would learn from that. And uh Uh, so, you know, there was just general like mentorship and, and, um, and like how you interact with mentorship, uh, uh, learned through that period. But also I'd say today from an investing program, uh, I would say that I know the renewable energy space pretty well because I, I networked a lot during that time. And a lot of folks that I met at conferences or just out doing business, uh, are now like kind of who's who in the renewable energy space, uh, specifically solar, uh, they're out with with big businesses or have sold businesses and started new ones. Uh, so I have a pretty good pulse of the development landscape um, uh, because of that experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know about any like stock picking takeaways from it, but uh, uh, it was a good experience. Yeah. Continue with the allocator point. You just oh, yeah. With yeah. The yeah. I, I got a chance to join what I call a concentrated family office. So it's a multifamily office, but not just your, run of the mill wealth planner. It was someone who, who, uh, it was a, a team that worked on a single family that had multiple siblings. So it was multiple pools of capital, but we managed it like a single family office. Um, and we were allocating to concentrated stock pickers, long only long short. Um, some of your traditional, like long short hedge funds that, uh, aren't just constant, you know, that, that aren't just concentrated, but more, uh, maybe quantitatively driven, but with a fundamental bias, um, some real estate, uh, distressed credit. Um, I, I joined that team when, um, uh, we were coming out of the financial crisis and, uh, and, uh, and we had uh, some investments in distressed credit. So I, I learned that space, uh, pretty well. Um, and I, I was there for, I don't know, almost five years, uh, and, uh, and then left there, uh, to join a university endowment, uh, where uh, specifically I was working on private equity. And what is your takeaway from these two positions for investing? They are more close to what you do today, but yeah. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of uh, folks have like a very coherent thought about their life at a certain time or whatever. And, and I would just say that with mine, it, it was just been, it has been a slurry <laughs> of, uh, of getting to know myself and learning uh, about investing and where I want to be within the world of investing. Um, in business. Uh, and, uh, you know, as an allocator, uh, it, it, they're good jobs. I mean, you get to travel the world and meet like the best investors in the world and support a mission that has real impact in the world. Um, and, uh, and, and then turn it off at 5 PM, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, like, like that's, uh, uh, that's a, that's a sought after job. It, it's a good role. Uh, um, but I, really, over my experience there and learning more about investing and spending time with what I'd consider some of the best investors in the world, seeing how they manage and, and how they think and, and how they invest. Uh, um, I was really developing my own investment style uh, and really learning more about myself that I really like to be the person that has the, the pulse on the risk being taken um, and, and not having a very large, broad portfolio Uh, and, and pushing the risk being taken to the managers, I found myself wanting to be the manager. Um, and I had proven to myself in my personal account that I could manage a concentrated long only strategy. 
Um, and that strategy was in formation over a period of years. Um, and I'd, I'd really say that uh, it really clicked with me when I was at the university endowment and spending a lot of time in private equity, um, which kind of rounded out my equity investing uh, allocation background, um, that I could really apply this to public markets. And I think that I could raise some money to experiment and see if I could actually grow a business uh, uh, doing this in, in my own strategy. Uh, and that whole process was a little bit like pulling hen's teeth, we say in the South, <laughs> uh, uh, of just like, you know, being in my like mid late twenties and going through your first, uh, career crisis that, that everyone goes through at that time, uh, and just needing mentorship and guidance. And, um, if you're listening to this, uh, uh, stock picking managers that have given me advice and, and, and guidance. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, I really got um, directed right uh, and and was able to launch Nomadic Value Partners, um, and uh, and so far been able to grow it to a sustainable place. So, why didn't you go into private equity when you had this experience, and why did you decide for public equity? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, because I do think about my investments in the portfolio, like a private equity investor, I, lots of folks say that, uh, and, and lots of folks mean it. Uh, and it is very different than thinking that you're, that you have a stock that you're trading. Um, so I, like we do own stakes of businesses. Um, and, but I also, uh, um, private equity is, is very much a, uh, networking, uh, almost political, uh, hustle, uh, trying to, in a very competitive market to get deals. Uh, so you have, uh, and, and this is where I deviate from private equity and my strategy is, is the approach is the same is that we are looking for, um, long-term growth opportunities, typically in market share gaining companies that are on the right side of change. Uh, and that will create value for cor a corporate a strategic that might take out the company or the company is so unique and special, it's creating real terminal value for itself. Um, and really identifying how a company would choose to compete and take market share as a preferred strategy to do so. And um, uh, you identify that through a lot of research and hustle of networking and working through, you know, uh, talking to experts and other investors and and folks that work in the industry that you're um, a, a researching and companies that you're looking at. Uh, and once you kind of identify what you want to own, like the preferred asset to own, that's where I deviate uh, because we're in public markets and I wait for the right price um, to where I can generate a forward IRR that is acceptable, which is not, uh, not only high, but, you know, uh, inclusive of all the risks <laughs> that accounts for the risks. Uh, and uh, um, a private equity investor then has to go find an asset to buy. And then they have to convince that asset to sell, you know, they have to convince the founding team or whatever, uh, or another GP that owns a stake in the business to sell them a stake. And uh, that is a very different thing than pure investing. <laughs> uh, at the same time, I also, I, I would be lying if I said I didn't find the drama of public markets interesting uh, and volatility interesting. Uh, so it's just, it very much sits my, uh, suits my personality to, uh, uh, to research like private equity and to execute my investments like public equity. So you like soap operas? <laughs> market. Uh, I wouldn't say I like soap operas, uh, but I, I definitely, um, if a stock's down big in the day, uh, uh, it definitely motivates me a little to get to researching. Uh, uh, it's not what drives my research process is stocks being down, but like it, it, it adds a little bit of uh, uh, drive to my, you know, uh, research efforts when, when there's blood in the streets, let's say. Yeah. What is the acceptable IRR? you're looking for an investment yeah or you can also say it's like acceptable irs because you have different buckets of investments you're looking for yeah you know it it um uh, that's something that has evolved with me um and and you know i i approach uh and this kind of gets to portfolio construction too uh, uh it's going to be hard to wrap it all together into something 
in a bow. <laughs> That's it. But, uh, uh, but like it, uh, you know, I'm looking for opportunities that are very like ideally balanced across revenue growth, margin enhancements, capital returns, changes in valuation, right. Are the drivers of, of an equity return. Um, uh, I, I don't want to build a portfolio full of revenue growth. Uh, and that's it. Uh, cause you generally find yourself with a bunch of multiple fade. And, uh, and if you look like it, if you, you know, build a strategy like that, uh, and then you have a great decade coming out of like the 2010s and then you find yourself owning a bunch of momentum and you didn't realize that until too late, <laughs> uh, uh, which I think happened to a lot of folks in 22. Um, uh, and, um, uh, so like I try to balance that. Uh, so like I own some companies that have high revenue growth. Uh, some companies that are margin turnaround stories, almost uh, some stories that have some capital return and in, uh, involved with revenue growth, uh, and then some stories where uh, um, and stocks aren't just stories. I don't know why I'm saying stories right now, but uh, uh, you know some some uh, uh, stocks that that, that we own uh, where uh, um, the multiple leading up to 22. Uh, it was always a one or two percent kind of forward IRR on the portfolio of multiple headwind, and coming out of twenty two, that doesn't exist anymore, and we've got multiple tailwinds, uh, and uh, uh, and that that's uh, positive, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, but uh, um, so with all that said, uh, you know, I try to build an IRR that at least beats the portfolio, right? Uh, the weighted average. IRR of the portfolio. When, and I say I've, uh, that I've evolved because when I started, I was like 20%, you know, and, um, and the reality is you can find, you can find high teens with relatively low risk. You can find high twenties with much more risk <laughs> and much more levered to, uh, and leverage is not the right word, but much more correlated to, or uh, overly exposed to one of those value levers that I, I described a second ago, and it kind of gets the portfolio out of balance. Uh, so I've learned to keep a really close pulse, you know, it's quarterly as companies uh, release their financials and it's tracking along with a, a thesis that I have uh, and I'm updating some intrinsic value or some, uh, some trajectory of revenue growth or margins or something. Uh, I'm updating that quarterly and the weighted average forward IRR of the portfolio is kind of the reference IRR for new ideas. Right. Um, with that said, I will let stuff drift as they, as it trades up, I'll let stuff drift down to 10% or so, um, uh, of a forward IRR that I'm expecting. When you start to get below 10% and that's happened to me a few times since I started nomadic, um, when you start to get, below 10%, I don't think it accounts for the risks involved with you being wrong. Uh, so uh, uh, if, if you were to be wrong on something, you could cut your IRR in half down to five. <laughs> and uh, and that's not, that doesn't even beat cash today. So like uh, I start to exit positions, even though they're, they could be great companies and the thesis is proven true and they're still, they're still, you know, execute, uh, executing towards that, uh, it, um, uh, I start to, I start to sell it then. Yeah. It's time for a quick advertisement. Here we go. Are you looking for a beautiful and efficient way to analyze stocks? Then please check out what my friends at Stratosphere are building. They've built a great tool to visualize data, to get ideas about ownership of stocks and many more information that's helpful in your analysis process. You can find the tool via the link below and feel free to sign up. It's free. Thank you for your attention. And now Edward Tillman and uh, we already deep in the weed swift portfolio construction. I know, uh, I know, I know, I know. But it's important. I mean, it's uh, yeah. uh, you know, it all when you think about what's your required rate of return, it's it's reference to the portfolio's weighted average return and you have to get into it. So yeah, I know. <laughs> no, it's it's great that we we're into this. And I think you said stories because it's also a bit of a strategical thing you can do. You're not private equity. You have to be in this name when you just bought it in, in the stock market. We can be strategical and also say, oh, the story has played out and I go to the next one. Uh, it's the flexibility we have. And yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And, and it has to show up in 
like a thesis, uh, you know, I call myself a thesis driven, uh, you know, uh, like I have a thesis driven research process. Um, that's a commonly used phrase in like the venture community. Um, lots of people could, and I would even say this, you could sit back and say, well, we're all thesis driven, right? I mean, it's just, but, but what I mean by that is like really developing a view of how to best compete in an industry to capture market share. And there's unit economics attached to that. You should be able to take those unit economics and build it up uh, into your thesis uh, to, to, to support it. And it should be expressed like the thesis ultimately has to be expressed through those value levers of a company, revenue growth, margins, uh, capital returns, change in valuation. Uh, capital structure, too, is a part of that. So like, uh, you know, a company that has the ability to leverage the balance sheet over time and return cash to shareholders. But it, it, and you can tell, too, it gets circular, but uh, it, uh, uh, it has to be a thesis has to be distilled into those. Um, those economic variables, right, uh, to build up a forward IR of a stock. Let's jump over a bit to the structure of your business. And uh, one of the classic questions I often ask is about the name of a company. So your company is named Nomadic Value. So why Nomadic and why Value in in the name of the company? Yeah, so, uh, you know, firm names are interesting because like uh, we were talking before this call, you know, a lot of lots of people just end up with the name of the street. Right. And and uh, which is great. Uh, uh, it's a geographic location. It might mean something significant to the person too, who, you know, lived on the street or had family home on the street or something. Um, mine is uh, I really like to backpack. Uh, and uh, um, I've been increasing the distances farther and farther, the intensity uh and um and that has really evolved over a, a decade plus period uh for me where i've really uh, my relationship with uh long distance walking and nature has um has just evolved and i in like a really good way uh that i kind of see parallels to investing where we evolve as investors uh so you know we're a homo sapiens. We were nomadic peoples. Uh, there's some, you know, there's something to walking, uh, and, and the evolution of, of, uh, uh, learning. And, uh, so I think nomadic value d uh, distills that, um, uh, really that experience that I've had through long walks, uh, and value, uh, is what we're, you know, we're investing for, uh, buying mispriced securities and things below their intrinsic value. Uh, so you put them together, nomadic value partners and, you know, partners is a, uh, you know, my structure of my business is I don't have a hedge fund vehicle. Uh, they're separately managed accounts. So partners does not imply, you know, a limited partnership or anything. Uh, it's, uh, but it does, uh, and it does imply how I view my clients, uh, when we are along this journey together, uh, and, um, uh, so it, I've spent a lot of time actually, uh, it, it's in my firm slide deck. Uh, there's a couple slides in there. Uh, actually, um, uh, Graham Rhodes, uh, helped me with this a little bit. Uh, Graham Rhodes with, uh, uh Long River, uh, who I followed him on the internet for some time, but actually, uh, met at Berkshire this year, uh, uh, in person. He helped me with, uh, helping distill stuff that was already trying to, communicate in my slide deck and the way I thought about, you know, starting the business and, and, uh, I, uh, this certain book called, uh, the model by Richard Lawrence, uh, who started overlook, uh, which is a, a, a really successful stock picking firm, uh, f focused on Asia. Um, and that he just, uh, Richard Lawrence distilled what made overlook great so well. And, uh, and I was like, yes, I mean, this is like, uh, 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 I've been trying to figure out how to communicate this of like, uh, being fully aligned with the client. And, uh, so like I, I the word partners, uh, is, is a really key word in nomadic value partners. Uh, yeah. What kind of partners or slash customers are you talking, targeting with your partner? 
No, it's not your partnership with your firm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're certainly not customers, <laughs> but uh, uh, they're you know they're uh, I mean they're clients that are requesting a service, right, of money management, but uh, and 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 outperformance of you know of, a, of an index or or their alternatives. Uh, but uh, um, you know, I started like most stock picking firms, uh, you know, single single manager, but in this case, single analyst PM stock picking firms where you start with friends and family, right? I don't have a track record from a previous firm. I need to build one. And, um, and that was really the idea when I started was I'm going to get friends and family, uh, initially, uh, and I'm going to kind of keep my head down and build a track record for about three years, which is what the industry kind of wants. Right. Um, and then from three years to the five year record, which is what a lot of institutions want, uh, Uh, to see, you know, uh, for staying power and, and confirmation of track record and, and skill. Um, uh, you know, then I'll just, I'll, uh, start reaching out and, and hopefully can grow into new clients. What I've been able, uh, to attract since start is friends and family, and then some other private equity investors that I've known, uh, from, from back when I was an allocator, uh, and, uh, uh which has been great because they're actually a, a collaborative with research with me. Uh, and, um, uh, and one small charitable foundation, uh, which was in formation that I've been able to help grow, which I'm proud of. And, uh, and, uh, and now I'm reaching out to, uh, larger, uh, like family offices, uh, and, and institutions. Uh, I will say I have a couple wealth manager clients, uh, that have their clients invested in my strategy. Um, and they've been great clients because they're, you know, relatively sophisticated investors and, and from an allocator point of view and, and, um, it keeps my overall, uh, uh, communication times, you know, time spent on communication down because I have just a select set of, of, of clients, uh, that, um, doesn't require a lot of time to, to still spend impactful time communicating to them, but yeah. How would you describe your circle of competence as an investor? Yeah, I think it is really difficult these days to be a generalist um, and not be, uh, uh, you know, resourced to your eyeballs with uh, with alternative data and the ability to uh, uh, get almost any bit of information in the world. Uh, almost within seconds. Uh, um, it, it, uh, so if you're playing a different game than that, you know, and, and like long-term focus, uh, it's still really hard because there's lots of long only shops that have been around for decades and have institutional knowledge of industries and companies, uh, and opportunities don't last for very long. Uh, so as an investor, you have to spend time really understanding an industry and all the players and, uh, and, and where the industry is going, um, to be able to feel confident in any kind of terminal value or any kind of, um, intrinsic value, whether it's not a high terminal value, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, some special si a situation in a, in a company or something where a company's in structural decline, but, um, you can find value there with a catalyst. I, that's not what I do, but, uh, folks do that. Uh, frequently in public markets, but it, that's getting harder if you're a generalist coming, trying to get up to speed on a name in a few days like that. Uh, like I, I'm not sure you're set up to outperform in that, in, in that scenario, you have to really under, for me, and there's lots of ways to make money. You learn that as an allocator too. There's, there's lots of strategies out there. And if you're consistent with it, you can find a way to, to outperform. But for me, it is, uh, I have, uh, I slow myself down from reaching out into companies as, you know, and, I, and I'm a generalist, I would say I'm a generalist, but, uh, um, I'm just not going to buy something that take, that requires me to get up to speed in a few days or a few weeks, even, um, it's, it is long-term efforts, understanding an industry, uh, and all the private players in the industry. So it's public, you know, all the public companies, um, I call them the, the large public incumbents. Uh, and then under like market mapping and truly understanding all the private players who has financed them from a private equity point of view, uh, what's their track record in this industry? 
what do they, you know, where do they see value and where do they target that? And what, they're doing it again, you know, uh, uh, you know, or like lots of these private equity firms will, will do the same playbook three, four times, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and it's um, understanding, you have to understand all of that. And it's a continual work in progress. And uh, I think that you have to build years and years of, of that, you know, build an institutional knowledge of an industry uh, and all the players in it. And, uh, uh, and then you can move quickly uh, and with conviction and, uh, and be accurate on your, you know, investing, uh, investing is predicting the future, right? Uh, uh, and that's really hard to do. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think you, you've got to focus uh, in areas where you really know so that it increases your odds of getting the future correct. Um, and for me, that's just been a, a, a specifically that's been um, a small handful of industries. Um, and I'm working to grow new, a, a new industries all the time. But it, you're not going to see me take positions in companies and something that I've been working on for a few months. Um, you know, uh, it's going to take longer than that. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, for me, it's it's um, it's been industries that are like mission critical to society. So like healthcare services. Right. Which is a big one for me. Um, energy and specifically renewable energy. We kind of touched on it earlier. Um, uh, some niche financials like like uh, like asset managers. You know, uh, uh, like, like I'm in that business. I know that business pretty well, right? I used to be an allocator. I know a lot of the folks, folks, I know a lot of the firms that are out there um, trying to raise capital and what their track records are like and what their team, you know, how their team members have turned over and things like that. Um, so like you, you have to get really in the weeds on this stuff. Um, but for me, it's the, these big, slower moving industries um, that are generally highly regulated which kind of slows down the change, but are still undergoing like a, an evolution as an industry into some positive uh, direction. Right. So like healthcare services is this big, you know, alternative uh, payment models around pushing risk closer to the uh, delivery of care. Um, that is a very slow moving trend, but it is the future of healthcare. Right. And you understand how the incumbencies work and how entrenched they are and that they're not going anywhere. <laughs> uh, and, and to be a healthcare, like there's like one key insight in healthcare services that if you get right, you can find opportunities that are like perpetually mispriced that, that generalists move through the market, short sellers, pod shops that are trying to catch the next quarter or short sellers that don't understand the business, but move in, quickly and aggressively, like all these things keep these share prices or, you know, the, the valuation of these companies in places that um, are undervalued in my view on some companies. Um, and uh, it allows me to, uh, to hold with conviction and I think generate outperformance, but uh, um, it, it's um, uh, yeah, that's been for me, it's been those slower moving, relatively regulated, uh, but, uh, moving into a positive new, new shape and form and you can get on, you can get into the right side of that and, and apply that private equity lens and, um, public equity discipline of, of, of owning the company at the right price, uh, and, and not owning it at the wrong price. <laughs> uh, and, um, and it, you know, it allows me to stay concentrated and, and focus, you know. You already mentioned healthcare as a sector um, you've done deep work on and did, did all the puzzling and hustling uh, to get an idea about this sector. What is important to not lose money as an investor in healthcare? What yeah. are your lessons? Yeah. There? I'm going to say healthcare services. So like healthcare is nearly 20% of GDP mm -hmm. and that, it, that includes a lot of like, like pharmacy you know, and, and, uh, biotech things, uh, uh, but like, uh, healthcare services, uh, is where I'd say that I, I know a fair amount about. And, um, I'd, I'd say the, the one key insight with healthcare services is, uh, if you don't own one of the large payers, the large, uh, 
incumbents like United Healthcare or Elevance Health, which used to be Anthem. Uh, um, if you don't own one of them, <laughs> uh, then uh, it is just really difficult to compete. You're like razor thin margins. Uh, you've got concentrated market shares in, in these large payers that have lots of market power. Healthcare is really local. So you got these large companies that are all, that are all over the country, but they compete zip code by zip code. And, uh, and so like understanding how local healthcare is and that, um, one company, if you're, uh, say like a healthcare provider, uh, say primary care provider, uh, for instance, and you're, you're doing well in Florida or like a specific County in Florida, that does not mean you will do well in Arizona. Right. And, uh, and um, so like it, it understanding the locality of healthcare is important. Um, and then I'd say like the key insight outside of that is uh, if you are a business that's trying to be on the positive side of change within this value-based care uh, shift um, for me, it, it was like a, my light bulb in that was um, the only way you're going to be successful taking market share and scaling a, a a business that has any shot of being a really large and b profitable uh, is you have to solve problems for every single stakeholder in that healthcare services value chain. So that's the that's the centers for uh, Medicaid and Medicare services, the CMS, which is the regulatory body. Uh, uh, you have to um, you have to be on the right side of what they want. Uh, the future of healthcare to be. And they tell you what that is. You can read all kinds of white papers. They have all kinds of webcasts. They can, like you can, uh, it, there's a little bit of politics in that, but actually it's been pretty insulated from politics. Uh, uh, it's, uh, so it, it, they've, they've been pretty consistent with the direction. Um, so you have to understand that. Uh, you have to understand what the payer wants. So the payer obviously wants some profits. <laughs> they want more members. Uh, they want to be in alignment with what CMS wants them to go. Um, so you have to you have to scratch the itch of the payer. You have to uh, solve problems for the provider. So you, say say you're a primary care provider. It's, it's the example. Uh, and I've got a company in the past that I've owned that I can talk about that highlights this. But um, uh, you have to solve the problems for the provider, which is the doctor. So you may be a corporate owned primary care clinic across the country, but but, you know, like an asset management business, your assets walk in and out of the door every day, which is your doctors, right? Um, so doctors are overworked. Doctors uh, uh, spend too much time on admin tasks. Uh, doctors don't get to see the follow through and the impact of their patients enough. Um, if you can solve those problems for a doctor, um, then you don't have near the issue as a corporation with recruiting doctors, which has been a big limiter on growth. Um, and you have consistency with doctor to patient relationship, which creates outcomes. Um, you have to, and then I, the most important, uh, you know, a last here in this example, but the absolute most important is to have outcomes with the patient, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the patient has to be healthier and live longer. And be like mentally satisfied, emotionally satisfied with it, um, and and that shows up in NPS scores, outcomes from like lower hospital readmits and better outcomes post surgeries, and and um, shows up in uh, for this is also where a group like a primary care provider that generates the best outcomes, they will also generate savings to the system, which they can get paid as a bonus. But they also uh, lower uh, churn of health plan members. So if you're a health plan uh, and you have a member that's seeing this certain primary care provider, if that uh, primary care provider is in network and that uh, um, patient loves that primary care provider and has gotten better outcomes from it uh, and has better satisfaction, they're not going to churn from their health plan near as much. So uh, the health plan actually gets this patient acquisition funnel from the health uh, from the a primary care provider. So you see that there, there's like this ecosystem of, uh, of stakeholders that are all related and they all, you need to solve problems for all of them. If, 
uh, say that if you're not one of the big giants with with lots of market power in a local market, um, that's the only way you're going to scale. So like all these telehealth providers, all these uh, clinic providers that have poor outcomes, uh, um, they're, they're just dead and uh, they're already dead. And uh, uh, either they can get growth by underpricing and having and having large losses. OK. Or they could try to eke a profit and not have the outcomes and they can't grow. Uh, so they're going to get a really low valuation. Uh, so like it, 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 you've got to solve, you got to figure out how to solve those problems. And, and once I realized that, uh, it, it like, like like changed my life with, with healthcare services, but like it, it is the key insight. You know, Lee Lu talks about having a key insight is, uh, once you have a key insight that, that separates you from the consensus, um, uh, you have got to trust in your work and you have got to load up, right? <laughs> uh, it, it, there's a, there's like a famous, uh, uh, lecture he gave at, at, you know, the Graham Dodd center for investing or whatever the, the Columbia business school class, uh, you know, back in like the middle two thousands or something, but like, uh, if it's a key insight from this interview, it's the, take the key insight lesson from Lee Lu. And learn about the key insight that I learned about it. But no, uh, um, it is. It, it, it's that's the if you can get those things right in healthcare services. Uh, first of all, it will it will filter out like ninety percent of the companies that are in your universe, and then will allow you to really understand the strategic value of these companies. So uh, the example being like, so I own shares of this company called Oak Street Health, and Oak Street Health is a Medicare Advantage uh, senior focused. Uh, primary care provider. And what I mean by that is they're a doctor's office <laughs> that has a brand. They've built a brand around it. Uh, and they've got a clinical program that generates results and not only way better outcomes and longer life for seniors uh, and better satisfaction for the experience for seniors, but um, uh, has scratched the itch of the payers because they're out there acquiring patients for this new health plan, right? Um, and it generates savings and the health plan likes it because they can sh share some of those savings with Oak Street and, and the plan can, 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 can use the savings to craft better benefits for their health plan and, and accrue more members and get higher revenue from higher star ratings. So like, I'm not going to get into all those details of what that, but it, it's complicated, but, uh, um, Oak Street was a big, was solving problems for everybody. CMS liked it because they were generating health outcomes and directing, health insurers in the right direction. Um, that company, I, I actually knew about that company before they went public because uh, I did a, a big, long project on understanding um, primary care providers and where that was going within this alternative payment uh, and risk model, uh, um, business model. Uh, and uh, several companies came out of that uh, that weren't public yet, but then went public. Uh, a company called Iora Health, uh, which was actually the dog of the bunch. I didn't like them. Uh, uh, Cano Health, which went public via SPAC. Uh, um, CareMax um, that I knew, Deerfield, which was the, uh, they also went public via SPAC, sponsored by Deerfield, which is a healthcare investor I knew actually back when I was an allocator. Um, I knew that they were kind of um, wanting to do something in that space. Uh, you know, via their spec. So I didn't know about CareMax, but uh, I knew about CareMax after they announced it and studied it. But I knew about Oak Street um, from their late stage VC rounds. And like Oak Street, you talk to folks in the industry, you talk to other experts that have d done business with them or, or in and around them, talk to doctors that work there, uh, uh, talk to one of their really early hires that have been promoted uh, consistently. Uh, on the battlefield in that company. And, uh, um, and Oak street was just separated from the pack. They had built this amazing culture. Um, and they had built, uh, I should back up and say that the company was founded by a couple of guys that were healthcare consultants. Um, and it was founded post the affordable care act, uh, in 2010, which allowed for these risk-based models to really take hold. And so the company was founded in what I call like the, the Petri dish of, of uh, incubating um, these business models. Uh, and it was a huge success. 
and they standardized the model, built an org an organic growth engine for patient acquisition. So a lot of these private uh, of these primary care providers um, were just acquiring practices to acquire patients, and then coming in with some kind of uh, set of technology, like a suite of technology to better uh, uh, deliver value based care. Uh, but they were, you know, acquiring practices. And I had identified that is not the preferred way to do it because uh, it's adverse selection. You're basically buying a practice from an old doctor that doesn't have much intention of bettering their practice. <laughs> um, uh, now, there may be young doctors in the group that that want to, but uh, uh, you you basically you're buying a mature practice for full value uh, and versus Oak Street, which uh, was creating new practices from scratch and going out with community outreaches, uh, community outreach organizers, they, they call them, and uh, to get patients. Um, and if you'd done the math, uh, and I'd gone back and, and there were some assumptions that had to be made, but that were, that were triaged with um, other, uh, uh, you know, a collaboration of work with folks that I knew in the private equity world, as well as experts talked to it. Uh, that uh, um, Oak Street was creating, like so, like from like a cost per patient acquisition, Oak Street was creating patients at one third the cost of their competitors, and so they were they knew they had a good thing, so they went out and raised a ton of money from General Atlantic, uh, and um, and a couple other firms, uh, in, in in a late stage round before they IPO and raised some more money. They were blitz scaling across the country. And uh, so they were generating enormous losses because when you blitz scale across the country, there's a lot of startup costs in each market, as well as when you acquire a new patient, that patient in the way value, the way uh, risk-based primary care in Medicare Advantage or any of these CMS models in traditional Medicare where, there, where it's risk-based, the way it works is uh, you lose money on that patient first couple of years. There's like a J curve on, on, um, basically riding the ship on the patient's health and getting them into the practice, uh, several times a year, uh, and staying on top and following through with, uh, 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 procedures that the patient needs to get healthy. Um, and, uh, uh, after a couple of years, the patient starts to inflect into profitability for the company. Uh, and in those later years, uh, they're very profitable. And so there's, there's, there's some math to be done on a per, per, uh, facility type unit economics. Um, and they had proven it in Chicago and I guess, uh, where the company was based. Uh, and I, there was contention in the street. Uh, um, there was contention on, on, on wall street that, that these unit e economics were gonna, uh, scale elsewhere. Also COVID. It right in the middle, like they IPO'd and then like COVID and, uh, and then their medical loss ratio, uh, which is not quite the same as an insurance company because they're farther down the value chain, but like it, it, people like to compare them like that, like ballooned because of COVID, uh, and because of their growth rate. And it was hard to disentangle what was driving that. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, the valuation was pretty rich. Uh, and so, you know, as markets were selling down in 22, as interest rates rise, uh, that had some effect. Um, and then there was this like DOJ civil investigative man that came out on the company for their marketing practices, uh, which I dug, you know, spent a lot of time into, uh, to realize that a civil investigative demand is not an investigation, uh, and they can write their wrong. And they did, um, uh, it didn't really cost the company anything. Um, but all these factors uh, came out in the company, like, like I think it was like from peak to trough was like down like 80% or something. Um, and uh, m my mistake was we sized it up too soon. Um, but uh, after doing lots of work, uh, like I went to their investor day and met management team and um, talked to lots of short sellers. <laughs> Uh, that there was, there, you know, uh, I think Jim Chanos was on TV talking about these businesses all being bankrupt and the business models broken. And, and uh, there were some hope, some high profile folks that were just against these businesses. Um, uh, 
and they're just wrong. <laughs> uh, and the reason why I bring up this story is, is uh, it highlights that, you know, we were able to get our cost basis down to really low and we ended up driving and significant money weighted uh, returns uh, out performance of the index on, on the name. Um, a despite from when we first bought shares to when we finally sold shares, when they got acquired by CVS, it was a negative time, a time when return, we still made lots of money on the name. Um, but it, I, I bring all that up to say CVS ultimately bought them out. And it was because, uh, there's a little bit of like CVS wanted a primary care platform because other, other large companies were buying them, uh, and they wanted one too. But at the same time, Oak street was the premier asset. And, and there are synergies. There are lots of, of high impact synergies uh, within CVS and Oak Street uh, being combined. Um, and that is where, you know, having this, this view of if you can solve problems for everyone in the system, um, there is enormous strategic value to this company uh, to a large player in the value chain. So like a United Healthcare or a CVS or and elevens or something. Um, and, uh, and um, I don't think any of the short sellers out there or any of the naysaying long onlys that are watching but don't own it, I don't think any of them saw that coming. And uh, uh, and it's just uh, uh, those opportunities are out there. And, uh, and so within healthcare, that is my working model. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not sure how, how much that, I mean, I, the whole like a uh, shared uh what's that econ um the whole costco thing everyone says yeah. which is uh, scale economy is shared yeah 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 so like there's models like that in other industries right uh uh, uh and and um but th they rhyme but they're not the same so you just have to dig in there and find uh what is it you know and uh and then look for it and uh and oak you know the oak street example for nomadic was i think it highlights kind of that private equity approach, the understanding of, uh, 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 where this val both sides, the public, like the, what the public equity incumbents want and what the private equity guys want and are investing for and kind of, um, arbitraging the two views, right. And finding where the intrinsic value of this company is. Thank you for already answering a lot of my questions on the healthcare space, uh, in your long explanation for the ones that want to hear uh, more in a fresh idea from Joshua uh, they are invited to apply to the good investing plus community because in this interview format we also do an idea pitch that will be exclusively released in the community so feel free to apply via the link and to Joshua thank you very much for this part of our interview and all the listeners thank you very much for listening till now I hope you enjoyed it Thank you and bye-bye.